my message. Today we're just going to go ahead and kind of do a Bible study. We're going to use the book of Ephesians, which I've taught my family, believe it or not, for seven months, verse by verse. I started a home church about three years ago, and then now I, I've joined a church in Lakewood. I've gone over the book of Ephesians one more time, and it took me a year and a half. So I'm a, I'm a little familiar with the book of Ephesians. So if you can go there, I'm going to jinx myself. I just said I know the book of Ephesians, but I kind of have a somewhat of a grasp of the book of Ephesians. So Ephesians, now put your finger there and let's go to, you know what, let's read that main text, Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, instead be filled with the spirit, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart, and he goes on. Um, I don't know if he put John 14. It's really where Jesus started on the teaching uh, of the Holy Spirit. The person and ministry of the Holy Spirit really began there. If you want to be a serious Bible student, you always want to interpret the Gospels with the epistles. That's what we're going to do. We're going to take Ephesians to interpret the Gospel. In John 14... They were troubled, obviously. The disciples knew that Jesus was going to be crucified. He had told them that he would, and so they were troubled. They were depressed. And Jesus taught on the Trinity, believe it or not. He says, trust in God, the Father. Trust in me, because I go ahead and prepare a place for you. And then he speaks of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And then jump to verse 15. I don't know if you have there. 15, he said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Here's the result. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it is near season. And he goes on. Let's jump to key verse 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, not just profess to love me, but love me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If the gospel, if the Bible didn't have the epistles, we'll be going, what in the world is he trying to say there? So let's go to Ephesians. Thank the Lord for the Apostle Paul who wrote Ephesians in prison in Rome. And as he wrote to the Ephesians, he taught them about the riches that are in Christ Jesus. And one of them is being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's really the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He has the ability to bring the Father and the Holy, the, the Son into our, our hearts uh, what are they doing there? Are they just having a good time hanging out? No, they're there to make you more like Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit does that. And so the title of our message this afternoon is, What is the Spirit-Filled Life? Um, I believe if we understand this, we apply it, uh, I believe it will help us in our marriage, those who are married here. And it will help us, you children, to obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. It will help fathers not to exasperate their children, but to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. It will help us also, believe it or not, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, the spiritual warfare there, he says, be strong in the Lord. That's being filled with the Spirit and put on the full armor of God. And so if any of those relational issues perks your interests, this message is for you. If you haven't grown in the Lord for a while and you do have the desire now to grow in the Lord, this message is for you. I believe it's pertinent that we understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? What does it mean to be empowered by the Spirit? I, there's a lot of misconceptions, I believe, personally out there 
that, that really teaches the other way. But we're going to use the Bible. We're not going to use Pastor Dave's idea or prep, uh, assumptions about the spirit-filled life. We're going to use the Bible. We're going to use the Bible to underscore and elucidate what the spirit-filled life look like. What does it look like? I'm going to help you to uh, and unpack that for you. So there's our principles here. Spirit-filled life is. And so like I said, we're going to use the book of Ephesians. So let's go to chapter 1 of Ephesians. Now the book of Ephesians has one key word there, therefore, as a result. Paul divides this book into two things. First, he takes three chapters, one, two, three, to talk about our riches in Christ Jesus. Three, four, five, excuse me, four, five, six is the application of that truth. So theology, application, right? Doctrine, lifestyle, it always is in that sequence, not the other way around. There's too much preaching that says do, 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 and the average Christian, well, why am I doing it? What's the resources that will help me, enable me to do these things that you're calling me to do? So Paul lays that out also in Romans. Therefore, he uses 12 chapters, 11 chapters, excuse me, and he says, therefore, in Romans 12, the principle is there. And so that's what Paul does in Ephesians there. Verse 3, he says, praise God to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. He just goes on and on with all the spiritual blessing in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In the through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In him, verse 11, we were also chosen having been predestined according to his plan. So we see all this riches, forgiveness, redemption, adoption, all spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Everything that Jesus has, we have because we're in Jesus and Jesus is in us. Amen. How did that happen? The Holy Spirit brought that in. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so that's a little background. Now let's go to chapter 1, verses 3 or 13 to 14. The Holy Spirit identifies us as his own in terms of Jesus seeing us as his own. Verses 13 to 14. This is sort of like a background introductory stuff right now, but very key to when we get into Romans or Ephesians 5.18, it will help us. So bear with me at this point. 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit identifies us uh, as being part of Jesus. And you also, including Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him, where to seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. See, the other meaning for that seal there is an engagement ring, Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit is an engagement ring that we are married to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also a deposit ensuring our glorification in Jesus Christ. 17 to 18, the Holy Spirit helps us understand the riches of God's word, the riches of the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ. So 17 and 18 says, and Paul is praying at this point, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he had called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the riches that we have in Christ Jesus because you're not able to apply what you do not know. Okay, so you got to understand 
the riches that you have in Christ Jesus. Number three, the Holy Spirit helps us understand how much power we have in Christ Jesus. Verse 19, and your, his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed him over all things. Now, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us understand how much, we have, how much power we have in Christ Jesus. Now, this is not the power to claim a new house, a new car. You, you work for those things. But this power is really to help you to mortify the flesh, to kill the desires and the impulses of the flesh. Keep that in mind. Very key uh, set of verses here. Number four, the Holy Spirit raised us up from spiritual death to new life. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. I told you this is going to be a, a Bible study. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But, <laughs> but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So we were dead. God quickened us. We were dead spiritually. He made us alive. And what that means is he's given us a, a new sets of desires, impulses, and, and just desires to serve the Lord. And that's really the Christian life in a nutshell. Number five, the Holy Spirit gives us access to the throne of God, and at the same time, he gives us desire to be there, to be at his presence. Okay, 17, 18 of chapter 2. We're still in chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole, you know what, let's back up. 17, 18, my bad. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to to the Father by one spirit. Now, when you study Romans 8, he has not given us the spirit of fear, but what? The spirit of to cry, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit has the ministry to, the, to draw us more and more to the presence of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number six, the Holy Spirit brings God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to dwell in us. Remember John 14? We love him. The Holy Spirit will bring and usher in the Father and Jesus Christ. Paul is saying the same exact thing. 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. Talking about the Gentile believers. But fellow citizens with God's people, the Jews, and members of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him. The whole building, the church, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you two are being built together to become, I uh, lost the page here, a dwelling in which God lives by the, his Holy Spirit. A few more. Chapter 3. The Holy Spirit nurtures spiritual growth. Chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Now, this is really a key passage to understanding what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's namely put is this, taking off your dirty clothes to put on 
new clothes. He's going to repeat that in Galatians as well. He's going to repeat that in chapter 4, I believe. We're going to get there. So Paul prays. This is the second time he prays. Verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Back up. 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Remember the first prayer in chapter 1? It was to understand how much power you have. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now he's praying the prayer of enablement at this point. He's, made, he's praying for power. For you to mortify the sinful flesh and tendencies. So that's the background there. And he starts verse 16. I pray that you will be enabled with the power of God to kill the flesh. To kill the unredeemed flesh. Anger, hate, jealousy, unforgiveness. That needs to happen first. We got to understand how much power we have. So it is already assumed that we have enough. Enough power to say no to the flesh. I like what Martin Lord Jones says. You don't have to be in a prayer circle to be prayed on. You have enough power, the same power that it raised Jesus from the dead to say no to the flesh. I am not speaking about perfectionism here at this point. We do continue to sin. But we do have the ability to say no to the flesh. And I'm not against prayer circles too. But I'm saying you have enough power in you. And that's what Paul is saying. And we need to continue to kill the flesh because here's the result. So that, verse 17, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you be rooted and established in love. Another translation says that Christ may be comfortable in you. How does the Holy Spirit become comfortable in you? By we continually mortifying the sinful flesh. Jesus cannot grow in you. John 14, Father and the Son comes in you. They're not just hanging out there having a good time. They're there making you more like themselves. And we need to kill the flesh so that we can be filled with the Spirit of God. And that really is the message. I can stop right here if you got it. This is really what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I've been taught, nothing negative with any of my previous pastors, I've been taught just be filled with the Spirit. But you can never be filled with the Spirit according to our texts if we're not mortifying the flesh, if we're not taking off the dirty clothes. We cannot. You can't say, Lord, help me love my wife or my husband if you have anger in you. You got to kill that first so that God can fill you with the fruit. Of the Spirit. And he goes on, number three. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to understand the love of God. The love of God. The Holy Spirit gives that ability. So it's in sequence here. Kill the flesh. Right? Jesus is comfortable. You, you would say, wait a minute, I thought he was already there. Yes, positionally he's always there. But practically he's not comfortable there. Because there's sin sins in our lives and we need to kill the flesh so he's comfortable and when he's comfortable there according to this text he's able to grow us and then the other result of that is we begin to understand the love of God how much God loves me you see before we can truly understand how much God loves us we can never truly grow in the in the in the Lord that's true I've heard that 10 years ago and I used to think ah what is he saying but that's true if you're not really convinced that God loves you, you're not going to grow. And the Holy Spirit does that as we continue to read and study his word. Number four, then he will make us complete and mature in the fullness of life. The fullness of God and the Lord Jesus Christ begins to just take you over. The fullness of God. Ah, oh, they just feel so comfortable there. That they begin to grow. And he says, verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is work within us. This is not imagining a new boat. This is talking about the Gentiles and Jews who Paul persecuted. And he never imagined in his wildest dream that Jews and Gentiles will be part of one body. He was like blown away. 
Paul goes, what in the world? They were distant, uncircumcised. They weren't, had no covenant, the Gentile that is. They had no God, no Messiah, no nothing. They were separated. They hated each other. And Paul saw with his own eyes, Jewish Christians and Jewish Gentiles come together as one body. If they can do it, we can too. We can too. I like John Mark's prayer at the end there. That we'll continue to grow and love each other. But that can't happen until we mortify the flesh. Jesus is comfortable. God shows us how much he loves us. And then God just, ah, oh, he takes over in his fullness. And that right there is being filled with the spirit of God. One last one. Chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. Now, this is the principle, once again, of being filled with the Spirit, which is taking off dirty clothes to put on new clothes. Verse 20 of chapter 4. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. He's referring to the bunch of verses prior to that. He says, surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. How do you do that? You just say, I'm not going to do it. If you don't want to fall, don't walk where it's slippery. If you don't want that monster to grow in your life, whatever it is, don't feed the monster. If you feed the monster, the monster will kill you. If you don't feed that monster, it will die. Not completely because it's unredeemed flesh. It's going to stay there forever until we get the other side of uh, glory. This side of heaven, we're always going to drag this unredeemed flesh. Romans 7, right? What Paul wanted it to do, he ended up uh, not doing, right? Remember that, Romans 7? And so he goes on, verse 23, to be made new. Here's the put on principle of your minds. And put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Put on what? The Holy Spirit. Put on what? The Word of God. Being filled with the Spirit is the same thing as reading the Bible. Being filled with the Bible. Because when you look at Colossians 2.6, it says, Just as you receive Jesus, continue to grow in Him so that you will have thankfulness in your heart. Same result. Just like Ephesians 5.18. What was the result of that? Thanksgiving. Right? So being filled with the Spirit... It's the same thing as being filled with the Word of God. Now, from 25 to 32, he will give us the principles there. Take off, put on. Take off, put on. 25, let's go through that. Therefore, each of you must put off <laughs> falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. There's the, there you go. Put off. For we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold, a way in to do his work. Stop being angry. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, put off stealing, but must work, put on, doing something useful with his hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful put on for building others up according to their needs that is may benefit those who listen do not grieve the holy spirit of god why would we not want to grieve the holy spirit because he's the engagement ring he's the one that's sealing us a guarantor of our redemption he's the one that ushered in the father and the son to come in us he's the one that empowers to kill the flesh why would we want to grieve him make him sorrowful why would we why would we To 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. That's putting off that. And then be kind, put on. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The highest expression of love is forgiveness, in my opinion. That was my introduction. Now let's get to our text. <laughs> Ephesians 5.18. 
Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, fighting. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's two results, two consequences that happens that result from being filled with the Spirit, taking off to put on. You know that. You understand that now. To result, you'll give thanks in everything. Romans 8, 28, for God. We know that God will, what, work out all things for our good to those who, number one, who love God, not just profess they love God, but love God, and to those who are effectually called by God. Effectually called by God. So that's the first result. We're not going to dwell there. We're going to talk about the other result, which is submission. Submission is the direct result of being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, let's go to the wife's responsibility. I know I'm walking on eggshell at this point, so I'm going to tread lightly. It says, verse 22, wives, submit. Submit is a military term. You submit to if you were just a private, you would submit to someone who's a sergeant. You submit. You're coming under his leadership. Why submit to your husbands as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. That's impossible. Short of being filled with the Spirit of God hard it's difficult the culture says the other way around they say in contrast to that but why let me ask you a question why do you submit to God and his word it's because you want to be blessed don't you so if you want to be in a blessed position a position of blessing you need to submit as unto the Lord to your husbands. Amen. Obviously, anything that is contrary to the word of God, you don't submit to. Very clear. Moving on to husbands, <clears throat> 25. You notice there's more verses for husbands? You, you realize there's more verses for husbands. It, go, it goes clear cut to 33. Why is that? Is it because guys don't get it? <laughs> so let's go there. Husband's responsibility. See, the husband has the responsibility to submit to their responsibility. To love their husband as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. You may ask, how far, to what degree, to what extent should I love my wife? My wife? He says it there. Let's read on. To what extent? What's the purpose of loving our wife? He says here, to make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. And to present her, him, her, her to himself as a radiant church without stain. It just goes on. Basically what he's saying there is, here's the objection. Object of loving our wives, husband. To make her holy and pure. Anything that would cause that to happen, to stimulate that to happen, we want to do everything in our power to make that happen. And it's not shoving the Bible to her face. Don't do that. Encouraging her gently. Gently. With kindness. Conversely, anything that would impede that growth, that would harm that purity and holiness, you want to do everything in our power, husband, to stop it. Don't want to necessarily give you examples at this point. 
You may say, how far? Or to what point? To what degree? Let's read on. Husband ought to love their wives as your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. You know how much we love ourselves, guys? We wake up, wash our face, feed our face, brush our teeth, take a shower, hopefully. Sometimes, once a week. We do a lot of extracurricular activity. Those things are necessary and they're good. But we do love ourselves. That's a dead giveaway, right? It is to that degree. It is to that extent that we love our wives. And that can happen. That cannot happen. It's impossible. I know. I understand. Short of being filled with the Spirit of God. Because submission can't happen without the fruit of the Spirit. You can't be submissive if there's no kindness and love and self-control and patience and goodness. The kids thought they were out of the loop, but verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That little phrase, in the Lord, occurs 150 times in Pauline epistles. In the Lord. Because you're in the Lord and Christ is in you, you have all the riches, all the power in Christ Jesus to obey your parents. For it is right. It's rational. You can't do that if you're not killing the tendencies and the impulses of your sinful nature. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have 101 reasons not to obey your parents. So you got to continue to kill that flesh, that pride in you. Oh, they're old-fashioned. Oh, they don't understand me. I don't say, if you don't understand your parents, you, can't, you, you don't have to obey your parents. I don't see it there. In the Lord really talks about being filled with the Spirit. How do you do it? I don't know. The best thing I can tell you is just stop doing it. Say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, take this thing out of here. Because it's already assumed, chapter 1, that we have enough power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Chapter 3, he prayed for the prayer of enablement. The power is in you. Just stop doing it. I don't have to go to a 12-step program or anything. If you're a true Christian, the power resides in you. Oh, fathers. Verse 4. Do not exasperate your children. Take off exasperation. Nagging. Negative comments that discourage our kids. Take that off. Stop doing it. You see the principle? It's already there. Take off so that you can what? Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Raising our kids is very simple, but applying it is a different story. I know that. But raising your kids in the Lord is really so simple. Teach them the word of God, and when they disobey, discipline them. And when they obey the word of God, reward them. Have a party. So kids, if you're having a hard time obeying your parents, whether they're Christian or not, be filled with the Spirit because they don't see the saving gospel. They don't see the power of, of the gospel in your life because you're not obeying them. How can they come to church? Vice versa. How could kids come to church if they don't see us parents living the gospel? There's no evidence there. And you do that by being filled with the Spirit. He goes to employees, employer will bypass that. Let's go to spiritual warfare. How late do we go to? Like. <laughs> 
It's filled with the spirit, I'm telling you. I got to have some of that. You better give me some of what you got, brother. Before I go there, this this is a prayer that I always have with our kids. We have family devotion. This is my prayer. I said, pray for dad that he will be a gentle giant. Gentle giant. Still hold to my convictions, yes. But the way I apply it, my tact. It's gentle. And I try to live what I preach. I don't really say a whole lot. Just live it. Because parenting is caught rather than taught. And with my wife, I would always ask her, help me to always be a servant leader. Servant leader. Too many parents are exasperating their kids, putting too much of a high expectation terms of academics you know god loved us even while we were sinners you know that hopeless helpless christ died for us and i've told my kids i don't know i don't care what you will do in the future good or bad success or failures it doesn't change my love and my honor and my pride of being my you know your dad nothing will change that because god never changed he loved me while I was a sinner. Of course, we pushed them towards excellence, not perfection. We pushed them to study hard. Yeah, sure, I understand that. But at the end of the day, their success and anything what they do does not depend. It will not, he shouldn't depend on how much we love them. Shouldn't. Shouldn't. Because God, the way he raised us, as he says he loves us so many times throughout the whole Bible, you don't believe me? Here, I'll send my son. He died for you. You don't believe me still? Here, I'll give you the Holy Spirit as an engagement man just to, to make sure that you're married to my son. Case, case closed, right? We're convinced. And so in the event that when God sends trials and tribulation in our life, we say, okay, God, I get it. You love me. You want me to grow. It's the same exact thing. We need to spend time with our kids and show them that we love them. That in the event that we do discipline them, they know it's for their well-being. This is why he's saying, instructing them in the way of the Lord. Some fathers have a misconception of the fatherhood of God. They think he's the angry God, a God of justice, not of grace. And so they implement that within their, the way they train and rear their kids. And so that has to go. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord. In his mighty power. That should ring a bell right there. Take off. <laughs> See, the whole spiritual warfare, I'm not trying to minimize the power of Satan. He's very strong. But spiritual warfare is this. If you want to defeat the enemy, it's really being filled with the spirit. Being strong in the Lord is taking off. Saying, no, I won't do it no more. I won't go there. I won't look at this. Just stop doing it. Because you have so much power, you don't even believe it. There's a lot of power in you. To say no to the flesh. You are a Christian. You just, that's why Paul said, I got to pray that you understand how much power you got. You have so much power. Don't ever let the devil tell you you're a weakling. You have enough power to say no to the flesh because the Father and the Son resides in you. How much power is that? Hmm, let me see. In the beginning, he said, let there be light. Boom. Splitting on the Red Sea. He has enough power. So he wants you guys to understand that. And then, verse 11, put on. There you go. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Amazing. Amazing. Romans 12. Therefore, what? Present your bodies. Kill your bodies. I used to be amazed why Paul, after 11 chapters of the glorious grace of the Lord Jesus, he didn't say, get saved. No, they're already saved. <laughs> they're already saved. He says, present your bodies because it's your bodies. 
It's this unredeemed flesh that's keeping you from becoming all that you can be. Is that like a commercial for army or something like that? You hear that so much, you know. Start saying it. I'm almost done here. But if you want to defeat the enemy, be filled with the Spirit of God. Take off for the purpose of putting on. Now, I said early, I said, being filled with the Spirit is the same thing as being filled with the Word of God. That's true. I don't know if he has it there. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Be filled with the Word of God so that you have a heart of thanksgiving. Remember, that's the first result of being filled with the Spirit. So the same thing. Yeah, right there. Thank you. So being filled with the Word of God is the same thing as being filled with the Spirit of God. Because the result is the same exact thing. So it's not, in one sense, it's not a mystical thing. It's being filled with the Word of God so that the Holy Spirit can take that and transform your thinking, your mind, your behavior. Next question. I got two more questions. We'll close. I know your question is, but I don't have any desire to study the Bible. Good question. Good, honest question. I think it's in 2 Peter. 1 Peter, what did I put there? 1 Peter 2 1. Yeah. 1 Peter 2 1. He says, Get rid, or get rid yourself of all malice, basically sin, taking off. So that you have what? A desire like a new babe for the milk of the Word of God. You see, parents, when your <laughs> children were infants, they didn't care if mommy smelled bad. They didn't care whether it was one in the morning. <laughs> they wanted milk. When you start mortifying that flesh, you have a craving like a new babe. Doesn't matter. We, you know, sometimes we get too structured. Always pray in the morning, eating. No, no. I, I study six hours a day throughout the whole day. Structure is fine. I'm not knocking off structure, all right? But when you start mortifying the flesh, you know what's the result? You'll be like a new babe, wanting milk, wanting the word of God, one in the morning, six, seven hours just, just delving in his word and eating his word and having pleasure. Now, your next question is, okay, I studied the Bible, but I don't seem to desire to apply the word of God. Good question. Honest question. James 1.21 same principle. Is it there? James 1.21. Okay, it is the one. Sorry. Therefore, get rid of all more filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word implanted. The structure of the Greek is this. As you get rid of sin, the Holy Spirit comes and makes you desire to apply the Word of God. I used to think why people like R.C. Sproul, uh, John MacArthur, a lot of people don't like him, but he's a good teacher of the Word. Why these people know so much? Spurgeon of late, late Spurgeon, all these great men of faith. Why do they know so much? This is, this is it right here. It's killing the flesh. Killing the flesh, killing sin in your life so that you have a craving for the Word of God, so that you will apply the Word of God, so that you will be able to start loving your wife or your husband and children start obeying their parents and then we'll start being good employees and employers because we're being filled with the Spirit of God. And then the world will know that we are his church. They can never understand our theology. They have no ability to understand our theology. But they do have the, the ability to understand our behavior. That's evangelism. 
Evangelism starts in here. It starts with growing the church. So that when an unsaved person comes in, they'll say, I want to be part of this. Not, I don't want to be part of this. People fighting back. Jealousy and strife. Who want to be part of a church that's just fighting constantly? Nobody. You don't even want to be there. So there's so much benefit to being filled with the Spirit. 